Hello, everybody. We are going to finish up this week with a Roman myth from Classic Myths to Read Aloud. This one we're going to read about is Perseus. Perseus, um, he and his mother, the mother's name is Danae, Danae, Danae. He and his mother were thrown in a, like a chest into the water by a jealous man. And let's see what happens to them. That, and all of that is in this story. But you've probably heard about Perseus. This is an interesting story about Perseus and the Gorgon's head, it's called. And the Gorgon, the the most wicked Gorgon is Medusa. So if you've ever heard about Medusa, that's who we're talking about when we're talking about the Gorgons. Okay, once there was a princess named Danae. She was so beautiful that mighty Jupiter himself had fallen in love with her. And Danae bore him a son whom he named Perseus. When the boy was only a few weeks old, Danae's father, who was a very cruel and a wicked king, learned from a soothsayer that his own death would come at the hands of his grandson. So he sealed both Perseus and his mother in a large trunk and he cast them out into the sea, there to meet whatever death awaited them. They floated about for many days and Danae held her little boy close. She sang him sweet lullabies, both to keep him from crying and to hide her own fear of the great waves that crashed over the trunk. But the wooden chest did not sink, and one day it was washed up on an island where it rested on the sloping shore. There, some kind people found them, and they gave Danae and her little boy a home. Both mother and son lived in peace and happiness there for many years, until Perseus was no longer a boy, but a brave and fearless young man. Now it so happened that the island on which they landed was ruled by still another wicked and cruel king perhaps even more heartless than Danae's father. And he had condemned his own, Danae's father, who had condemned his own daughter and grandson to what he presumed would be a watery grave. When this island's king heard of Danae's beauty, he wanted to have her as one of his palace slaves so that she would always be near him and so that he could punish her if she refused to do his bidding. So the king thought long and hard about some means of getting Perseus out of the way. For he knew that if the boy were gone, the king could easily do whatever he liked with the mother. At last, he thought of an adventure that would please Perseus and at the same time would be so dangerous that the youth, he felt sure, would never return from it alive. On another island far away and in the middle of the ocean, where fierce waves beat against the shore all day long, there lived three terrible monsters known as Gorgons. They were half women and half dragon. They had beautiful faces, but their bodies were so hideous that one could think of them only as ugly monsters. Instead of skin, they had large scales like fish. Their hands were made of brass, but most horrible in place of their heads, there writhed hundreds and hundreds of poisonous snakes with open mouths and hissing tongues. These were truly not very pleasant creatures to meet, as you can well imagine. With one blow of their tails or of their brazen hands, they would have crushed poor Perseus like a grape. But worse than that, worse even than the deadly bites of the snakes on their heads, was the power of their fierce eyes. For whoever looked at a gorgon in the face was immediately turned to stone. Of the three, the most terrible was Medusa. And the task that the king had thought of giving Perseus was nothing less than cutting off Medusa's head, snakes and all. Since merely looking at Medusa would turn Perseus to stone, and he could not very well cut off her head without looking at her, the king was pretty safe in thinking that this was an adventure from which Perseus would never return. So he sent for the young man, and when Perseus stood before him, the king began to praise his boldness and his courage. 
which he said had been the talk of the island. Perseus, of course, was flattered by these words of praise, and he replied, Indeed, O king, I think there is no task from which I would shrink in fear. The king was delighted to hear this, and he said, If I had thought that, my boy, I would let you undertake a task that I am saving for the bravest man in my kingdom. And do you think me worthy of the honor, cried Perseus in great delight? Well, you may try it if you like, answered the king. It is to bring me the head of Medusa, complete with its snaky black hair. Perseus gladly agreed, and he left the palace. Oh, how the wicked king chuckled over the success of his plot. In seeming to do the boy a great honor, he was really sending him to his death. Now, after poor Perseus left the palace, he began to think over his promise, and somehow the plan did not seem nearly so pleasant, nor as easy as when he as it had when he was talking with the king. In fact, the more he thought about it, the less he liked the idea. In the excitement of the moment, he had promised to do something that would surely cost him his life. When he had passed the gates of the city, he sat down under a tree by the roadside, and he began to think how he could accomplish what he had promised to do. But the more he thought, the more hopeless his task seemed. Perseus was a very brave man, to be sure, but the bravest person in the world would rather be alive than be turned to stone. And the thought of what would probably happen to him made him so sad that he could not keep the tears from his eyes. Suddenly, a voice said, Perseus, why are you weeping? Perseus raised his head in surprise, and he saw a strange-looking fellow with an odd-shaped cap and wings on his shoes. It was none other than the swift-footed god, Mercury. But Perseus did not know this. Still, there was something so kind and comforting in the tone in which the stranger asked the question that almost before he knew it, Perseus was telling him the whole story. When he finished, Perseus waited for the stranger to say something, but Mercury sat silent for a few moments, lost in deep thought. Finally, he said, my boy, you have undertaken a dangerous task. Yet, with my help, you may still succeed. But first of all, you must promise to do in all of the things just as I tell you. This Perseus promised to do, and Mercury then began to rummage through a large bag he had brought with him, removing its contents one at a time. Mercury revealed his identity to Perseus and told him that the gods and goddesses had been watching over him since his, his birth, and that it was they who had guided the chest-carrying Danae and him to safety. Now they had given to Mercury some of their own possessions to lend to Perseus so that he could accomplish his dangerous task. Pluto, who reigned over the dead in the land below the earth, had lent him his wonderful helmet, which made whoever wore it completely invisible. Minerva, the goddess of wisdom and welfare, sent down her shield, which shone like gold, so bright that it reflected every image like a mirror. And last of all, Mercury pulled out of the bag his own sword with its sharp, crooked blade, which could cut through anything in a single stroke, even the armor-like scales of a gorgon. And finally, Mercury added one other gift, his own winged shoes, with which Perseus could fly more swiftly than the fleetest bird. Now, all that Perseus had to do was find out the way to Medusa's island home. Mercury told him the only people in the whole world who knew where they were, who knew that, were three sisters who lived together in a cave. They were truly the oddest sisters you could ever imagine. But the strangest thing about them was instead of having two eyes each, as you would think, there was but one eye for all three of them. They took turns using the single eye so that while one of them had the eye, the other two could see nothing at all. And while they were passing the eye from one to the other, all three sisters were, for the moment, completely blind. It may have been only a single eye, but oh, what an eye it was, worth much more than six eyes put together. With it, the sisters could see what was going on in the farthest parts of the earth, and that was how they knew the way to Medusa's home. To this cave in which the three sisters lived, Mercury led Perseus, and after giving him some parting advice, hid himself in the grove nearby while Perseus stood just outside the cave behind a bush and waited. By and by, one of the women with a wonderful eye in her forehead came to the door of the cave, 
As she was led, as she, as she led her sisters by the hands, she told them of everything that she was seeing with the eye, strange things that were happening in countries far away. They were interested for a while, but then one of them began to grow impatient and said, Sister, it is my turn to use the eye now. Give it to me. And the third sister said quickly, No, that's not true. You had the eye last. It is my turn now. And the middle one who had the eye cried out, Please, sisters, just let me keep it a little longer. I think I see someone behind the thick bush just behind the door. When Perseus heard this, he trembled in his winged shoes. However, he need not have been afraid, for the sisters continued to quarrel over the eye until at last the one who had it was forced to take it out of her forehead. Now at that instant, all three sisters were blind, and Perseus, seeing his chance, darted out and seized the eye, and then began a dreadful hubbub, each one of the three insisting that the other had taken the eye, and these accusations went on and on until at last Perseus spoke up. My good woman, he said, do not be frightened. Your eye is safe, for I hold it in my hand at this very moment. <gasps> With a cry of anger, the three sisters started in the direction from which the voice came. But Perseus was too quick for them. On his winged feet, he rose high in the air, and then from a safe altitude, he crawled out. You shall not have your eye back, my friends, unless you tell me exactly how to find the island on which Medusa lives. This was a secret the sisters did not wish to divulge at all. But the prospect of losing their precious eye was a thing too terrible to think of. So after a few minutes, they told Perseus all that he wanted to know. And he set their hearts at rest by clapping the eye in the forehead of the sister standing nearest to him. He flew at once back to the grove where Mercury was waiting and Perseus thanked him for all the help. Then bidding him a, the god farewell, he started out alone on his errand. He soared over many lands and seas until at last he came to the island where the terrible, terrible Gorgons lived. He dared not look down even for an instant for fear of being turned to stone. But Minerva's bright shield served as a mirror and reflected in it. He saw the three monsters lying fast asleep on the shore below him. A less noble youth would have fled immediately at such a terrifying sight, but Perseus had a brave heart. Excuse me, I need a drink. So taking his sharp, crooked sword in his hand and fixing his eye on Medusa's image in the shield, he darted down. With one mighty stroke, he decapitated the sleeping Gorgon his sword passing completely through her neck and separating her snaky head from her scaly body. Then, still keeping his eyes fixed upon the picture in the shield, Perseus quickly wrapped up the fallen head in a goatskin bag he had brought along for this purpose. The snakes hissed so loudly that they had awakened Medusa's two sister, and these monsters stretched their dragon's wings and tried to follow Perseus as he rose into the air. But on account of Pluto's magic helmet which Perseus wore, they could not see him and he escaped with the head of the snaky locked Medusa tucked securely in the goat skinned bag. Back over land and sea he flew and he had seen many strange adventures along the way. At last he reached the island where his boyhood had been spent and he learned the sad news that his mother had been bound in slavery by the evil king. Now Perseus was full of rage, and he hastened to the palace at once to demand his mother's freedom. The king was more surprised than pleased to see Perseus, for he thought the boy must surely have died long ago. Aha, Perseus, he cried, so you have come back without doing what you promised to do. Your courage is not as great as you would have us believe. Nay, your majesty, said Perseus, I have slain Medusa and have brought, your, brought you her head back her head. Then you must prove it by showing us the head, said the king with a sneer, for of course he did not believe Perseus at all. Since your majesty insists, Perseus cried, behold the head. And drawing the head from the bag at his side, he held it aloft in all of its horrid beauty. The king gazed at it for an instant, and with the sneer still on his face, and then frozen motionless, he turned to solid stone, sneer and awe. When the people heard what had happened, there was great rejoicing, for they had feared and hated the cruel king. Perseus chose a better Perseus chose a better rule for them. 
ruler for them, under whom they lived in peace and happiness. Perseus knew that he owed his success to the help that Mercury and the other gods had given him, and he never forgot the debt that he owed them. The head of Medusa he gave to Minerva. She was very much pleased with the gift and placed it in the center of her bright shield. From that time on, whenever Minerva was seen in battle, her radiant shield glistened with the head of Medusa, turning to stone all who gazed at its horrid beauty. Okay. Why does Perseus's grandfather throw him and his mother, Danae, into the sea? Why did he do that? Yeah, he was very jealous, wasn't he? He was jealous and he was concerned because he had learned from a seer that Perseus, his own grandson, was going to kill him. So he was frightened and he was worried that Perseus would actually carry out that particular um, omen. So instead of letting them live, he threw them into a chest and threw them into a sea, thinking for sure that they would drown in the sea. What does the cruel king on the island ask Perseus to do? Absolutely. He asks him to go get the head of Medusa. Yeah, sure. What three gifts does What three gifts does Perseus get from Mercury? In my notes, it says Zeus, but I know that's wrong. It was Mercury who came and gave him the gifts. What three gifts does he get? He gets the shield from Minerva. He gets the helmet from Pluto that makes him invisible. And he gets the sword of mercury, which is so sharp that it can cut through the Gorgon's head easily. But he gets one more gift. Yes, mercury gives him his shoes, his winged shoes. How does Perseus successfully complete, complete, complete his quest? How does he do that? Yes, he does. He flies over the island. He uses the shield as a mirror so he doesn't have to look directly on the Gorgons. Because remember, if you look directly at the Gorgons, you turn to stone. So he uses the shield as a mirror, and he looks in the shield until he finds the heads of the Gorgons, and then he chops off Medusa's head. Mm -hmm. And he wraps it up in goatskin so he doesn't risk looking at it and takes it back to the king. What eventually happens to this evil king? I know, right? He turns into stone because he looks at Medusa's head. He does not believe Perseus, that Perseus has chopped the head off. So he demands that Perseus show him the head of the Gorgon. So, so Perseus does show him the head of Medusa, and the king turns to stone with a sneer on his face. Do you think that Perseus is a hero or not? And why? Why do you think he might be a hero? Why might he not be a hero? Well, some people think he's a hero because he rescued his mom. That certainly would make him a hero. And he rescued all of the people from that evil king. So that would make him a hero. But why might some people think that he was not a hero? Yeah, he, he tricked the Gorgons, not the Gorgons, I'm sorry. What were those three women called? The three old women who only had the one eye. Anyway, he tricked them into, because he took their eye. And the only way he would give it back is if they told him where Medusa was. So that's not very heroic type thing to do, is it? No. And he also might not be considered a hero because he was a bit vain, a bit conceited. He loved the king's praise as the king was telling him how wonderful he was. And so Perseus was just enjoying all of that. And he was thinking he was a pretty big dude and that, you know, he was something to be feared. 
So yeah, some people might not think he's a hero for that, but most people thought he was a hero because he did save his mother and he did save the rest of the, the island people from the evil king. That's all I got today. Actually, that's all I got this week. I'll be back next week with more. You guys have a great week and a great weekend because it is Friday. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.